Uh, okay. Let me just do glasses here. Um, right, well, welcome everyone to our panel on co-publishing. Um, we decided to do this panel uh, earlier this year because Irene um, from Staunton from Weaver Press, who, is, who, who couldn't make the panel in the end, and Susan and I did a collaboration. And out of that, we, we felt that there was something interesting to share, even though most of us have been involved in co-publishing in other ways. <laughs> so this morning's panel um, is, is really just going to be um, Susan Hawthorne and Jessica Powers. And they will introduce themselves to you. They're both very experienced publishers having worked in the field of independent publishing for a very long time. Together, that would probably add up to, a, uh, yeah, a huge figure. So let's hear from Susan first and then from Jessica, just who you are, a little bit about your publishing focus and where you're based and your, your, your sort of broad aims. Um, my name's Susan Hawthorne. I'm the publisher at Spinifex Press. In Australia, we always begin by acknowledging the Indigenous owners of the land where we live and work. And I'm coming to you from Jiru country. Um, Spinifex Press, which um, was co-founded by Renata Klein and I back in 1991, um, is a fairly small independent feminist publisher um, we've been around now for more than 30 years, which is in con constantly a surprise to me. Um, ever since the beginning, we have done quite a bit of co-publishing. Um, we um, our, our books cover quite a range of, of subjects. We've, we've published about 300 books across those 30-odd years, wow. uh, covering poetry and fiction, fiction and a quite a range of non-fiction subjects. And we publish both Australian writers as well as international writers. And we, we now have uh, writers from every continent, which I find quite thrilling. Um, and um, we have also been involved in book fairs at different times. The International Feminist Book Fair was a very important um, series of fairs that we attended in the late 80s and up to the mid 90s and um, well I, I will say more about spin effects as we go on. Thanks um, Susan. Jessica? I'm Jessica Powers and uh, I own Catalyst Press in the United States. Um, I've been in publishing for 22 years First, working for Cinco Puntos Press, um, which was known for publishing writers along the U.S.-Mexico border and indigenous writers from the greater southwest of the United States, um, as well as uh, children's books that were bilingual in both Spanish and English. Um, and then I launched my own press, Catalyst Press. Uh, first books came out in 2017, and my focus at Catalyst is publishing African writers and African-based books. Um, and I launched a second imprint as well a couple of years ago with my brother. It's called Powers Squared and um, we publish science narratives. And the two imprints together have published, um, I've published almost 50 books in the last six years. Um, so wow. I, I, I have no memory of how many books I worked on at Cinco Puntos. <laughs> It was a long time. Um, I'm also a writer and have nine books um, published. And um, and so that's that's me. And I have done a lot of co-publishing and collaboration um, with other publishers uh, over the years. And then I guess I will say another form of co-publishing that I have done um, and willing to talk about is I've worked with many, many authors who self-publish entirely separate from my print, from my press and worked with them to help, um, you know, get into the system and get distribution and publicity, et cetera. And so that's another form of um, kind of, I guess, co-publishing where I partner with them and help them through the process. So. 
Um, I just wanted to say that Susan is also um, an author and has published how many books, Susan, yourself as a writer? I think um, I think 14 authored ones and are probably about the same number of edited collections. And yeah, so writer who is, is who is also the public publisher at Spinifex also has a huge number of books as a writer as well. Okay. Yeah, so it's an interesting... Um, if small panel we have here today. Um, I'm really sorry that Irene couldn't make it in the end, Irene Staunton from Weaver Press, because it's such a different context to those that most people would know in, in Zimbabwe. And through enormous hard work and imagination, they've managed to keep going and publish incredible books, many of whose authors have gone to make it in, you know, the international market <clears throat> um and they've also done some interesting co-publishing but yeah it's it's a it's a very tough environment these days so co-publishing what is it i mean in a sense the the, the phrase uh, you know is self-explanatory um but there are there are things to unpack about what it means and then there are things around co-publishing adjacent to co-publishing that we can look at as well um so, I mean, the way I understand it is that you decide on a project. And I mean, I think these things happen in different ways, not necessarily one publisher has has the book, does a whole lot of work and then gets someone else. You know, I mean, the different the different time frames as to how people get involved with it. But it's it's about sharing and collaborating, making decisions about who's going to work on the editorial, the design. Um how are you going to market the book? Are you going to do it together? Um, but really it's about sharing costs in order to make it possible for a particular book to reach a wider audience and to make it more cost effective for the individual publishers to bring that book out into the world. And the book that we worked on, which in a sense wasn't a typical co-publishing example, um, because it came through an agent, which was Chinonogwa, and Irene was the person who, who got the book first and re-edited it. It had actually strangely been published already kind of 10 years ago by um, Lucy Mushita. Um, but anyway, we've republished it. So, so Irene did the, so in my case, we were working with Irene, they, um, she re-edited it and they did the book design and Mujaji, we, we did the proofreading and um, Weaver Press also produced the cover and then the only thing that was different about our two editions was the imprint page and the South African edition having our logo actually I think they also had our logo in Zimbabwe I can't remember but anyway you know so it was our our, our copy looked looked almost identical and then um, I mentioned to the agent that they should approach Spinifex and maybe I'd spoken to you informally Susan I can't remember but now that book has come out um, in Australia as well. Um, so, Susan, do you want to? Sorry, there are two things we're talking about. I'm, I'm, yeah. Um, the one is the definition of co-publishing, what it is, and then I'm also just through this example of Chinonogwa, which is not a a perfect example of co-publishing because it's got some complications. But um, yeah, it was the it was the catalyst for this um catalyst <laughs> for this discussion. Susan. Um, okay, so the, the first time I, I ever gave a talk about co-publishing was back in 1990 when I worked for Penguin in Australia. Uh, and it was at the um fourth international Fem feminist book fair in Barcelona. And the idea had been put forward by Ros de Lanarol, um, who actually originally came from Zimbabwe. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I think I heard of Irene at that time via um, Roz. Um, and uh, she had the idea of talking about feminist publishing, um, co-publishing, and as a way of getting books out, as you say, internationally, uh, simultaneously. Uh, and, you know, immediately we all went, Oh, what do you mean by simultaneous? <laughs> <laughs> and who's going to print it? I mean, where will the printing happen? And 
what about the problem of a dominant language versus an undominant version of that same language? So, I mean, Australian English is slightly different from UK and US English, for example. Um, and so we we had this long discussion about the pros and cons of, of co-publishing. And, and there are lots of co pros and cons. There are some fabulous things about co-publishing and there are things that you can just make mistakes with. Um, but in terms of, so, so yes, co-publishing is about, sometimes about sharing a print run. Sometimes it's about, um, in which case, you know, with with you and and um, Weaver being in countries next to one another, I presume you printed together. Um, yeah. But when it came, no, you didn't. Okay, um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, that you yeah. can do do yeah. run, print runs. Um, the alliance used to um, run a lot of co-publishing things and when when we first joined the alliance back in 2007 there was a lot of co-publishing that happened um that we joined in with through that Z press was was part of um and the Z was doing uh, was working with publishers in in different countries some from latin america some from uh, different african countries different countries in asia and as an Australian press, we kind of hobbled in towards the end, you know, we were. Um, but what what was done with those books, they had separate ISBNs but and and barcodes, but the um the logos of all of the publishers were on the cover, on the back cover, so that that made it clear that this was a book that was being published in many countries simultaneously. Uh, I can't remember the details about where books were printed and how they were distributed. Um, but, you know, we would receive our books. I think they probably came from the UK, but I'm not sure. Um, and, and then we would put them out. At that time, I mean, something happened in Australian copyright law that made that increasingly difficult to do because if you received a book more than 30 days after it had been released overseas, then you couldn't secure the territorial rights, which meant that publishers in the US and UK could dump copies of their books into the Australian market if they wanted to. Uh, we hope they wouldn't, but, you know, that's that's just a hope, really. Yeah. Um, so, so that became increasingly difficult. Um, now, so far as Chinongwa uh, went, um, we... We talked with you and with Irene, and we did we did share the typeset copy. I mean, we purchased the the typeset copy. Um, we then did a bit of editing because the um, there were some things about the language that we needed to just make a bit clearer for Australian readers who were not. Um, southern in the southern african region where there might be a bit more sharing of of un, or understanding of language um and so we did that and then we created a new cover for it as well and we printed um in australia uh so yes our book looks different from yes. from your edition. um just curious how many did you print just to give an um you don't know i think and Probably four, five hundred in okay. that that uh, area. Yeah. So I mean, I think that we printed two hundred, and I think maybe um, Irene printed two hundred as well, just to give you an idea of the yeah. book buying context. Um, it's hard going, and I mean, one one of the benefits of co publishing, if you can actually do it with a joint print run, is you can build up that print run so you might be able to print say 2,000 copies or 3,000 copies and therefore reduce the unit cost um, and that's a real advantage but it's hard to make that happen mm. um, and and the logistics of it are, are difficult although 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't I, yeah, it it's maybe there are POD versions of it these days. Who knows? Yes. <laughs> Jessica, um obviously you're not gonna talk about Chinogwa, but um yeah, I um yeah. I have co-published a number of um books and and it's looked different every time. Um I think my first co-publishing um venture was very early on in starting Catalyst Press where I worked with um a South African business um to create a set of two graphic novels that were about the um Zulu um King Shaga and um these were graphic novels intended for young adults and you know high full color um exciting adventure story lots of history it took a lot of work um and i think in our case we kind of went fully in together um that organization um ended up doing the the first part of the work um which is kind of the production they sort of managed the production with me weighing in, um, they worked with the author to develop the storyline and create the illustrations and get the print ready files together. And um, I was consulted during that process and, and part of the whole process, but they were really managing the whole production process. And, um, you know, graphic novels are very expensive to produce. So we sort of agreed that we would each put in half although that's you know harder to do in in practice than in um theory and at that point things were once once files were produced and ready to print for this graphic novel um we we then went to print and um at that point it was sort of i'm actually the publisher right so um they're considered the co-publisher but don't actually have a publishing apparatus had no distribution have you know no experience in the publishing world but lots of experience in producing uh, beautiful books but you know nothing on the the other end and so at that point um you know i had a you know a print run arranged in hong kong and um some of those books uh went to south well actually i think the bulk of those books came to the united states and were distributed internationally that way. And then we did a separate print run in South Africa um, for the local market there. Um, and uh, and then, you know, I've been responsible since then for all the marketing and distribution and um, subsequent print runs. And, and that includes the distribution locally in South Africa, but also internationally and, and particularly in the North American market. Um, that was an interesting process and, um, you know, really wonderful to have partners who knew how to produce a, a beautiful book. Um, but, um, but the ongoing work of kind of keeping it going is definitely in my hands. So it's, it's an interesting division of labor, um, that we produced, um, in another, graphic novel collaboration really the the author could be considered a third co-publisher because he really got the um it is a dramatically wonderful graphic novel about um stories that he found legal stories he found pre-apartheid South Africa that were about resistance and rebellion um to the the government in in South Africa and he he worked with illustrators and got these files to be print ready. Um, and really, I mean, he was much more than an author because he worked with the illustrators and worked with the graphic designer and got these files to be incredible. And then um, at that point, both Jakana Media in South Africa and, and me, Catalyst Press, came together and we did do a joint print run. And essentially, um, we printed together, which was amazing. We printed... Um, I think about 4,000 copies um, with maybe the bulk of those coming to North America for me. And I I ended up with the worldwide rights, North America and the rest of the world, and they distributed it locally in South Africa. So they have South African rights, the other 
uh, publishing company, Jacana. Um, and I think that that did work well in terms of the print run. Um, but, uh, and, and, and worked really well, you know, he had, the author had excellent representation in his home country, um, as well as internationally through us. So, um, you know, again, it looks very, very different depending. And I've had, I think, a lot of other similar, you know, much smaller types of co-publishing. Um, and and recently I have just launched a, a third imprint that's going to be more hybrid publishing. So in a sense, I'll be co-publishing with the authors where they share in, in the financial risk, um, as well as the work of getting the book out. But that's a that's an entirely different kind of co-publishing, but but is a form of co-publishing as well. Um, and I I'll say that that of the two that I've talked about with the graphic novels, um, one major difference is that in one sense, the co-publishing that occurred with Jacana and myself was really really very separate. Um, in that they got their books, I got mine, and the, and there was, you know, no ongoing collaboration in terms of, you know, I did my uh, publicity, they did theirs. Um, we both just sort of assumed ownership of publicizing the book and just taking it from there. Um, but essentially, at that point, it was, you know, um, no longer kind of operating together with the other graphic novels, there was, has been sort of an ongoing, um, you know, collaboration and partnership, um, which, uh, you know, has mostly worked well, but sometimes hasn't always worked as well. So it's, inter it's I think, a very different thing when you're co-publishing with a completely separate entity and company um, and you're kind of operations are separate versus actually partnering with other people to co-publish where you kind of create an entity that doesn't really exist, but sort of does in, you know, <laughs> like a brand that isn't an actual company, um, but does exist. And, and, you know, that, that can create, um, you know, both a lot of opportunities and also some difficulties along the way, um, figuring out, you know, um, how to navigate this other brand um, that doesn't really exist in real life. Susan, I wanted to ask you, um, maybe you've got something you want to say in relation to Jessica, but you spoke about talking about co-publishing in the nineties, um, at a ping, uh, when you were working at Penguin, do uh, commercial publishers, big publishers, do co-publishing, or is it really a thing that is only not done really. by independents? No, not not really. I mean, um, we used to joke about um, how Penguin UK would send all its books to Australia, including the wildflowers of Southeast England. For which there might be people in Australia uh, who who could possibly have an interest in, but getting um, the Australian end of a penguin to the UK was you actually you really had to sell it to them. So no, um, that even within the company they don't really do co-publishing, and I expect that that nothing has changed. Um, in nine, their first co-publishing um, book was with. Um, Carly for Women, which then split into Women Unlimited and Zuban. And the book was a was about women's studies in, in Southeast Asia, women's studies, women's lives. And we were really thrilled to do that because it meant that we had uh, a book that had information about what was happening in the women's studies field um, with uh, writers from across Asia. And that was something that we felt was very important. Um, long before anybody in Australia thought Asia was important. Um, but, you know, that's how it is when you're a feminist publisher, you generally are ahead of the cultural curve. It's what we've learned. We used to think we were 10 years ahead. We now know we're 30 years ahead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we also co-published with a Bangladeshi publisher and 
probably the country we've done the most co-publishing with is India. Um, I mean, we, we, we've done a lot of books with, with Ritu from Women Unlimited, also with uh, Ubashi from um, Zuban, but also with Tulika uh, in, in Delhi. There are two Tulikas. There's Tulika in Delhi, which is adult nonfiction. There's Tulika in Jedi, which is children's fiction. So we've done books with with um, with both of them. Um, one of the one of the big books that we did um, was uh, Marie Monique Robin's book on Monsanto, um, and we finished up doing that as a collaboration within the alliance, where we finally got to meet the author, who was French, um, and. It turned out to have um, some things that were great and some things that were really difficult. The thing that was really difficult was the legal situation in the different countries. So the US um, New Press did one edit, but you can get away with a whole lot more in the US um, in terms of what you can say out loud and publicly. Um, we then had to do another um, legal read for Australia because the situation is difficult. I'm not sure if Tulika, what Tulika did in terms of the um, legal things, but they may have had a read as well. And at that point, uh, Zed decided to pull out altogether because they said they simply could not publish a book that said the things <laughs> that were said uh, in in the book. And um, at one stage in Australia, a, a, a very well-known um, ABC, the main uh, public broadcaster in Australia, had an interview, first of all, with, with the man from Monsanto and then, or no, maybe it was the other way, with the author, Mary Monique Robin, uh, and then with the Monsanto fellow. And she's saying all this stuff. And then he says, and the book has been published in Australia by Spinifex Press. You know, you can't expect that they'll say that most of the time. But in a situation like this, yep, they do. Are you going to sue, he said to the Monsanto fellow, are you going to sue them? Monsanto fellow said, we never do that. <laughs> we don't sue people. Well, of course they do, and they have, and we, we knew that. Um, so, so that had a whole range of really interesting and different, difficult um, uh, problems. Um, we've also worked with Jakarta a number of times. Um, they've taken um, some books where we've, where we've sold rights, actually, rather than co-publishing. Um, they, co they published Unity Dow's novels, um, and she's from Botswana, and... So we've done that, and but we've also worked with Jakana as as a co-publisher, printing wise. So we did the book Long Life with them, which was about HIV positive stories. Most of the contributors were were women, um, and we did the Kangaroo and the Kangaroo Court, um, which was also which was about Jacob Zuma um, and the rape trial. So that was interesting too. So we've been able to to do things like that. We also have done a few children's books. And, you know, the thing about children's books is you have to sell them cheaply. Like in Australia, you cannot sell them for more than $9.99 or $9.95, which, you know, is basically all you can do. So we've done two children's books where the books have been produced in India. And we did one with a Canadian publisher. Um, and she was doing quite a big print run um, internationally. She was very good at this, Maggie Wolf. Um, and um, so we came in on that and because it, we were part of a big print run, we were able to do a children's book with colour throughout and the other two were possible because they were produced, they were printed uh, and produced in India um, and that made those those viable. And the thing is, you know, co-publishing, um, is is different every time you do it something different happens we had one situation with an american publisher we worked with several times and when we received the books we discovered that she had put in a publisher's note without 
without uh, talking to us because she disagreed with one of the contributors. So that was not very good. I think we didn't go publish with them again afterwards. Um, and, you know, yeah, mistakes happen, you know, because, because you're operating across international boundaries, you're operating across different cultural things. And I, I actually think one of the really important things about co-publishing is finding a common culture. Now, for us, that's often been working with feminist presses because that's our common culture and we we share a whole lot of things that we don't share with other publishers. Um, and working with Indian presses, even ones that are not feminist, you discover there's a lot of cricket in common. Um, so you can have, uh, you know, you meet you meet over cricket. Uh, you know, there and actually India and Australia are not that diff different after all, and you know, South Africa also. So, so there are some some ways that you can get together uh, because of that cultural commonality, whatever it is. <laughs> I see a cricket book in the future. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be women's cricket, I think. Yes. <laughs> Um, Jessica, you wanted to, sorry, respond to something earlier. I'm and afraid that some... I don't remember, okay. <laughs> but it was, I, I wanted to insert something early on which, with, that she was saying, because um, but I, I don't remember what it was. Okay. I think that's a really interesting um, point about common culture, and I think it really depends on how uh, intensive the collaboration or co-publishing is, right? Because if it's purely kind of a business agreement where we're just publishing different editions of this book and going in on the costs and the print run, um, that's a really different kind of uh, arrangement where, um, which I think is a much easier arrangement, right? Because it's there's a, there's very little you know, I mean, there's some some logistics that have to be worked out. There's some, you know, managing of a, you know, few things and details that need to be worked out. Um, somebody needs to be arranging the print run, et cetera. But there's not a very kind of close working relationship in a lot of ways. Um, and um, and that's also and 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 I think that a lot of times that particular situation can be compared to the rights buying that um, Susan mentioned as well, because in a way, buying the rights to publish something, as, even if it's simultaneously, is a very sort of clean and simple process, right? You make arrangements, and, and this is, you know, a co-publishing where basically you're you're just kind of going in at the end on, on paying for things together and getting a print run. There's logistics, you're in, you're out, you're separate, right? And that's a very, very different thing, I think, than than um, even what you were talking about a little bit earlier, um, Colleen, where you and um, Weaver Press, I think, collaborated much more closely, but it was still a fairly, you know, separate process in a lot of ways. You know, she did the editing, you did the proofreading. Um, I'm not sure if your files were the same, you know, who did the design, who did the cover, was the cover the same, or did you guys have different covers? No, we um, did everything together. Yeah, see, and that's a much more kind of intimate kind of collaboration. And um, I know that you're the moderator, Colleen, but it would be really uh, lovely to hear you comment on this since Irene couldn't make it and she was going to be here. Um, and I certainly can talk about that too, because I think, it's a much more intimate process when you're doing everything together with a co-publisher and collaborating on that end. And that um, is, is a, you know, process that I think is, can be amazing and wonderful, but also has the potential for much more difficulties. Um, but it's a much closer uh, process. And so I, I would love to hear Colleen, I know you're the moderator, but comment a little bit on, um, you know, how that the intimacy of that kind of process works and what are maybe some best practices that you discovered for, you know, how to, and, and I'm happy to comment as well, but for, for how to operate best in a much more intimate partnership like that. Well, I think that, you know, 
um, working with Irene, I mean, she has become a friend. Um, I knew of her and had met her, but thanks to the Alliance, I got to go to the Geneva Book Fair a few years ago, and I was invited, and so was Irene, and we had our stands next to each other, and we were there, I don't know, I think for five days. Um, and so that was a lot of time we spent together, and then working together on this book, Chinonogwa. Um, so, you know, we had a combination of WhatsApp calls about things and shared files and had discussions about the issues. Um, I mean, I think to tell the truth, I would have been unlikely to actually have published Chinonogwa if it hadn't been working with Irene. Um, just because the book had already been published in South Africa and, you know, I couldn't completely see the sort of business value, so to speak, of doing it again. But I just thought it would be such fun. <laughs> these, are the, <laughs> these are the mad decisions that one makes as an independent publisher. You know, a combination of fun, but also learning from Irene. I mean, Irene has been working in publishing her whole life and has done incredible work. I mean, I just have nothing but admiration for her. And, um, you know, it was a huge privilege for me to get to work with Irene and just to like hear her talking through some of the issues and, you know, learning how she thinks and thinking together with her about the book and what we should do. I mean, there were issues and constraints that we had to work with. And so, you know, that was, um, yeah, I mean, I just, I, it's difficult to even say exactly what I learned, but, you know, it was a very, I mean, she's she's very gentle and kind and easy to work with for me. Um, I just wanted to give one other example that I did a few years, well, actually right at the beginning of Majaji, um, Jane Kachavivi, which some of you, who some of you might have heard of, she was an enormous force in um African publishing and was one of the uh, original uh, publishers who I think who started African Books Collective or who was part of that process. She comes from, well, she's English, was well, sorry, she she died I think last year or the year before. Um, but early on in Majaji's life, we, we um, co-published with her and a publishing thing she set up in Namibia where she lived. Um, and we published her memoir. Um, and I mean, that was amazing to get to work with someone of the stature of, of Jane Kachavivi. I mean, in a way, a similar person to Irene in some ways. Um, brilliant, but also quite humble. <laughs> I mean, that's, I hate that word, but, but sort of like, how can I say, not somebody who sort of claims all the space, but just like, you know, you just learn because they they make a lot of space and, you know, prepare to share their thinking. And um, yeah, so that was a huge privilege. And then after she died, um, so, I mean, we, we shared, you know, we shared the costs and the print run and she took the book and sold it in Namibia, which made it a lot easier because, you know, in, South Af in, in Africa, Southern Africa, distribution remains a huge thorny problem. <laughs> um, and it does happen, but it's not, it's not, smooth and perfect so to speak I don't know if it is anywhere but um but anyway they wanted to bring out a new edition so the last few years of her life 10 years or so she'd worked for the she set up and ran the University of Namibia Press and um so I mean I just gave them the files you know um <laughs> I wasn't going to um you know, sell them. I mean, I just felt like we'd we'd done the book. It had lived its life according to me, and now that Jane died, it didn't feel like a moment to suddenly capitalize on on that. You know, and I thought it was very nice that they would bring out an edition in Namibia, and that there was a renewed interest in her life and work. So, you know, I think those are some of the kinds of. <laughs> I mean, and, and none of this makes business sense, but to me, it makes a kind of ethical sense, you know. Um, I think in independent publishing, you know, when when um, accountants look at independent <laughs> publishing, they usually say, "Can you please do something else?" You know, I mean, it is it is one of those mad businesses. Um, 
but where, where we do it because we love it, we think it's important, we think it's absolutely critical. But I was also thinking about Ros, Ros Delaneral, who, you know, was a major force at the Women's Press in the UK, and she would have loved Chinongwa and she would have published it just like that. Um, the other thing that's been in, important for us with the book is it turned out um, that that actually Lucy, the Lucy Mushita, spends six months of every year in Australia. Um, so while her son, I thought her permanent address was Paris, but it, actually she's here in Australia for um, quite a bit of the year. Um, and we we worked with her quite a lot um, when we were editing and when we did the cover and we got her approval for the cover. And, in fact, she had a very good idea. At one stage we had the cow walking right to left and she said, can you turn it around the other way so that it's walking from left to right? It made such good sense. Um, and, you know, things things like that. And we had a, a launch with her and another writer last week because they were talking about the women of their grandmother's generations and Jinongwa, although she was not her grandmother, was of that time period uh, of, of Lucy's grandmother. And, and the other author, Robin Bishop, was writing a novel based on her grandmother's life. And it was absolutely fascinating. These two women from such different places, one Australia, one Zimbabwe, actually meeting up, talking about the issues and, and those sorts of things. So, you know, co-publishing, I mean, for me, that was like being able to do, a, you know, a cooperation, um, you know, across, diff you know, different authors cooperating and being able to put something out. And so we had a launch and now it's on our on our YouTube channel. Um, so, you know, it's, it's there for everybody. And Lucy was truly fabulous um, in, in that session. So, you know, there are there, there's also those sorts of things. I mean, Jessica, you were talking about working with the author, and in a way, I think you know the most successful. Uh, I mean, it's hard it's hard to gauge these things, but it is really good to be able to work closely with authors and and to you know do those sorts of things. The hard bit is getting the publicity, getting the distribution, getting the bookshops. And, you know, these are big hurdles, I think, for all of us and getting dis distributors, if you have them, we digital, well, we don't, we distribute ourselves in Australia, but we do have distribution overseas. So, you know, and that's because it became too hard <laughs> to have a di distributor in Australia. I mean, how, how silly is that? <laughs> That's another topic altogether, but yes, um, distribution it's, is quite quite an interesting issue for independent publishers. Um, did you have some, we were possibly going to talk about best practice. Um, I mean, I think that what I've learned with everything to do with publishing, that it's about relationships, you know, relationships with the other publisher relationships or, you know, the collaborating publishers and then one's own work with one's authors um, and all the people that you work with, you know, and, and having those relationships and making them, um, making, you know, I don't know how to put it. I mean, just having real relationships, not, not, um, um, you know, not, not that, it, 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 sorry, I'm trying to think of the word, so that it's not just about a transactional relationship, you know, it's an actual relationship, um, but I'm sure that Jessica and Susan, you have other thoughts about best um, practice. Well, yes, I agree. Um, for something to work smoothly, uh, to work in such a way that everybody in the process is happy with it, whether it's about the cover or about the editing or about paper stock, you know, I mean, we like to have our, uh, FS, what's called FSC paper in Australia, which is forestry sustainable. Um, and you know things like that. Um, how can we how can we make all of those things work really well and you know make the costs um, be fair for everyone? Um, and that doesn't always mean the same. Um, the costs will sometimes be different for publishers in 
countries where the uh, the value of of the currency is is different depending whether it's less or more um and you know th those kinds of considerations need to be thought about as well um so yes and i think they they are only possible if you have a good relationship you can i mean we used to make phone calls but you know we can zoom <laughs> that we can we can have emails you know we can send Mess, text messages, whatever, whatever it is, that's that that are the ways of keeping up a relationship, and again, a common, a common goal, I suppose, which is the cultural stuff. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. So, I guess, I guess that's what what I would put it, and and an ethic, an ethic of fairness as well, um, that you're not out to to rip off. You know <laughs> the publisher you're working with, um, or the author, or the or whatever. You know, and yes. and you still have to make it vi viable as much as possible. Yeah, tricky. Jessica, um, yeah, I definitely think, it, you know, every co-publishing relationship is going to look very, very different, and um, so I think in a uh, some best practices include um, really good negotiation skills and flexibility. Um, I know with most of the co-publishing that I have done with um, South African partners, some of the questions have always come down to things like, well, if we're printing, you know, if we're doing one print run, do we do American English? Or do we do, um, you know, South African English? Um, and this, it seems like this would be a simple question, but these can be touchy issues, right? Um, and, um, you know, I will say that usually it has come down to practical um, considerations in terms of, okay, where are we going to sell the most books? It's going to be North America, generally speaking, in, in all of the cases of co-publishing. Um, North America was is the larger market, um, and Americans are not as uh, in favor of, you know, I mean, if I'm distributing a book in the United States and trying to get um, reviews of it, and it's got uh, British spellings, I'm going to get dinged on that in reviews. In fact, I might not even get reviewed as a result, right? And and those reviews carry weight, not just in my market, but in the other market too, you know, to have a Publishers Weekly review, to have a Kirkus review, to have um, a New York Times review. And so in the end, we've had to negotiate very practical considerations. And in the end, you know, once again, America dominated, and that's not necessarily something that's a can be a problem and a political problem and a and a a problem in the relationship, right? And and it's it's one of those things that the other parties almost always had to kind of concede, and not because I was unwilling, but there's there's these practical considerations. But you really have to negotiate these things kind of carefully and sensitively. And for me to be aware too, you know, I mean, I I'm not trying to to dominate, and of course the United States has this as a a phenomenon and a political phenomenon around the world anyway. And, and I, you know, and it's, it's, it's a tricky space for me to navigate where I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to, to, to participate in this cultural problem of my own country's uh, making that, that is, it, you know, that is a problem. And I don't want my partners to feel that way, but there's also a reality of, of, um, economic feasibility and um and I think but there has to be uh, a negotiation and when there's these kind of cross-cultural realities and also realities that have to do with um political and economic forces that are a little bit beyond you know everybody's control but but can be sensitive issues you really have to work through these things in some of these collaborating partnerships and they're not always easy. 
Um, and at the same time, like I've had to concede and negotiate things too. I've, I've had many of my African writers. I no longer, this is not necessarily a co-publishing issue, but, um, but it could be, um, it's, it's along the lines of collaborating and, and negotiating and, and, um, you know, figuring out sensitivity and, and all of those things. But many of my writers have insisted that we not um, italicize so-called foreign words because they're like, well, who are those words foreign to? And they're not to me. Who's your, you know, who's your assumed audience? Um, and so, you know, words in Zulu or words in Afrikaans or words in French no longer get italicized in my books as a result of some of these types of collaborations. But at the same time, spellings are American. <laughs> so yeah. these are the types of things. So I think um, negotiation, sensitivity, not just kind of tromping all over things. Um, these things become important in in uh, co-publishing relationships. Um, when, when best practices. When I first learned that Virginia Woolf was re was reading the edited version of the American versions of her books, I, I I thought, what was that for? This was before I was in publishing. Why on earth would they need to do that? It's already been edited. Um, <laughs> but of course, the, the American editions had to have American spelling. Um, we basically have a policy of using the spelling conventions of the country from which the author comes. So we publish some books with American spellings because that's the, the, the system that some authors are using. They might be from the US or they might be from a country that's influenced by US spelling. Um, we also don't italicize foreign words. In, in Chinongwa, we did add a glossary at the end um, because some words were so unfamiliar and we had done something similar with a book um, uh, called Haifa Fragments that had a lot of Arabic words in it. And we just put a note at the beginning saying, you know, if you, you know, there's a glossary at the end on page, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it doesn't actually interfere with the reading. But if as a reader you want to learn what the meaning is, then you can. I mean, these days you can type anything into the internet and still get, and get an answer anyway. But still, I mean, books, books are, are, are fabulous. Um, I mean, one of one of the other things that I've had a really good experience with was the translations of my book Bibliodiversity, because they went into Arabic and there were five publishers across the Arabic speaking world um, who co-published. The similar thing happened with the French edition um, uh, across Europe and in in um, some African countries. Um, in the Spanish edition that they were from Chile and Argentina and they were done at different times. But I think it's also the fact that the Spanish in Chile and the Spanish in Argentina are slightly different mm -hmm. um, from one another. They're certainly different from the Spanish of Spain, but I think they're also different from one another in the same way that the the language of New Zealanders uh, from Aotearoa, um, that's um, quite different sometimes from Australia. And in fact, in Australia, different states have different standard words and standard Englishes. So, you know, yes, it's, I mean, yeah. I, I find it interesting and it's it's something we need to deal with. And I think the main thing is to deal with it sensitively, as sensitively as possible. And, you know, with those barriers and problems that you raised, Jessica. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when you're co-publishing across uh, cultural and political boundaries, there's a lot of issues you have to be sensitive to on both ends. And it's not, you know, it's not just uh, spellings, et cetera, although that can be a political issue. Um, <laughs> um, but it's, you know, there's there's just, um, you know, very different realities on the ground and the publisher in question is facing those. And I, I imagine if you're co-publishing in with a partner in certain countries, there's m many more sensitivities that you have to be aware of and and considerate of. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, right, we're coming to the end of um, our session. I don't know if anyone who's listening wants to ask anything or to contribute anything. 
I'll give you a moment. Um, I mean, we had thought we might talk about distribution, but I think we have run out of time. Um, so I, thank you. It's been fascinating to hear from both of you and to hear about your experiences and your wisdom. Um, um, so, yeah, I had a thought, of, uh, but it, it's also gone. It's hard to keep keep everything sort of. Um, oh, I was going to say uh, the the relationship with the other publisher that you are publishing with or publishers is that um, you know you can't sort of foresee everything in advance. You know, you make an agreement, and I mean, in the case of Irene and I, we didn't have a written agreement. We just it was an ongoing conversation, but, you know, things come up and then you have to um, figure it out. You know, it's not, it's not quite the same as like selling rights, which as Jessica said, is quite a clean sort of uh, approach to co-publishing in a sense. Um, you know, you, it's a one sort of thing. Well, maybe there, there are more things that happen actually, but you know, it's pretty clean, but um it, it is an ongoing conversation and, you know, something comes up and you have to decide how you're going to, to handle it. Um, the, think the more intimate, the collaboration, the potentially messier it can get. <laughs> um, yeah. I think so. the hardest thing to, to do jointly is promotion. Yeah. Because every country responds differently to, um, you know, the situation or the book or the whatever. And everybody, every, country has different media uh, problems, <laughs> outlets, um, you know, lack of diversity, all of that sort of thing, reduction of book review space, all of those things come into it. Uh, Barbara, there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's a, a question, question about, sorry, about distribution. I'm not sure we can talk about that now. It's like a whole nother, <laughs> a whole nother topic, I think. Um, but yes, um, yeah, I think I think I think the promotion is is difficult um, together. But you know, you can share. Like, I'm going to take your launch video, Susan. I'm going to watch it first, and then I'm going to share it on my platforms uh, as a way of talking about um, Chinonogwa. Another way of saying, look, you know, here if you want us to meet Lucy and hear her talk about her book. He has a nice thing. We had a great me. review in the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age last weekend. So feel free to to take whatever you need from that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So those are useful things, right. you know. Yeah, yeah. Those I think sorts of things are very helpful. I think we've our position at Catalyst has just been that if if the other co-publisher has done some sort of promotion related to that book in any way, we're going to celebrate it on social media. We're going to repost. We're going to, you know, if they have a video, if they've got a launch event, you know, it's, it's all part of um, in one sense, promoting that author who is also our author, even in, if in that case, it's um, you know, yeah. the co-publisher's edition of the book or the, um, and, you know, I've published a lot of Modaji's books. Um, and that's one thing we do all the time is, you know, want to celebrate Modaji as well as the authors that we share because we share some of those books. So um, it, it feels like a mutual way to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for getting up um in the middle of the night jessica and susan thank oh, you what what time is it in australia now 6 p.m so oh, it's okay. almost time for dinner <laughs> <laughs> okay well i'm going to go and have breakfast but um thank you everyone for being here and 